go a couple minutes. Mr. Technology, I'm You guys want to take a moment real quick? Um, scan the QR code. I've got a few questions and polls coming up uh, in the presentation. It's a little more interactive. Are you in the middle of all time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hopefully it works. And this guy needed me to hook his computer up for him. I don't even know what a QR code does. <laughs> it's all about having the right equipment. That's right. <laughs> Kind of taking the pictures, I'll go ahead with the introductions. First of all, thank you for attending the clinic this year. Um, uh, we're honored to have uh, with us Jackson Shep. He's going to do a presentation on high tech uh, and high jump. And high tech. He has been um, at North Dakota since 2022. He's currently the assistant coach, uh, works with the multis as well as the pool vault. Help me in welcoming Jackson. Thank you. Thank you. This is, uh, this is kind of a weird moment for me. I, I grew up in Buffalo, Minnesota. Um, actually, my, my high school coach, shout out to Mr. Carr and Mr. Palmer. Um, this week really brought me a big flashback uh, to that high school stress of presenting in front of a group of people, especially teachers. No, this is not MLA or APA cited. Um, I plagiarized a lot of this. I stole from a lot of people. Um, I'm sure you give them a shout out, but uh, yeah, from there, we're going to go. So, this is my second convention ever speaking. Um, I just want to kind of get a gauge in the room here. First poll, how many years have we in this room been coaching high jump? 10 plus years? One, four, for two, whatever. Again, just so like this could be as, much, as, ben as beneficial to you guys as much as possible. There's three topics I have. Um, it's a lot of slides. I probably won't get through all three topics today. So just rank in order for yourself which of the three you'd like to maybe listen to the most. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about his 
poorly as it probably could have ever been. <laughs> 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 So the hydro teaching system. So I, as as they said before, I'm the multi coach. Um, so a lot of the high drivers that I work with, they also we're also working on a great number of other events. A lot of kids come in to the college system and have not high jump. So I'm start like a lot of you, I've started from scratch with a lot of these kids. Um, basically, for the multis, for the newbies, drills, 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 drills. For me, it's kind of like uh, those one-off lesson plans that really help drive understanding. Um, it's not necessarily going to be the end-all be-all for developing true high jump ability, but in terms of lessons learned early on to help develop understanding of the events, that's what drills for me. So drills are very important for the initial start of the learning process, and as you move on to your career and throughout the season, uh, the drills get actually less and less important. But um, to start, I think the number one skill to teach is actually the the flight and bar awareness. It's the most foreign for a lot of these kids, unless they have a diving or, or gymnastics background. Most kids their entire lives, hopefully, it's, it seems less and less the case, but hopefully they're running and jumping as little kids. So those skills are actually pretty innate, and it's not the thing that you need to be focusing a lot of your attention early on when it comes to specifically high jump. Um, so the first drill we start with, and I'm, you're, I'm sure you've seen a lot of drills like back overs, um, so on and so forth. This is kind of the version that I do. It's a little bit more specific to what I think is actually happening over the bars. Um, so right here, this is Nell Graham. She's one of our head pathway 400 combos. Um, she's a returner. I worked out, this is my second year with her, so this is kind of what it looks like, the ideal, um, after a few years of working this drill. Okay, but a lot of times, this is a freshman, her name's Reese, coming in. Um, this is a lot of what we get when we start. A lot of crashing. Um, what I find in the high jump, um, especially when it comes to bar rotation, um, fl flight awareness, is kids are just, they're scared of that. They're scared of, let's see if I can pause on the right spot. They're scared of this, this sensation of the shoulders and the head being below their body. It's a brief moment in time, but it, unless kids are okay being in this position, they'll, they'll never hit it. Um, so we really work on, honestly, just driving comfort. So with Reese, what I tell her, what we're trying to do is I'm okay with her kind of crashing and burning, not looking very pretty here, but I'm trying to get the sensation and get her comfortable with her shoulders diving down and around the bar. Um, so a lot of times, what I used to teach and what I, um, I've seen in the past is the traditional back over drills where the back is completely to the bar, jump for height, kids get coached to throw the head back. Um, there's, a, there's an actual reaction, um, a reflex response when the head flies back like this and it's, it's dipping down, the legs will kick back as well, elongating the body. It's actually something you want to avoid in rotation. You're actually trying to shorten the body to allow for more rotation. Um, so in the in this drill, the teaching point here is I'm actually I want a flat back. That's a, the position we're looking for here. We're looking for the flat back across, hands on the thighs, knees bent, and a wide space in between the knees and the, uh, keeping the legs nice and wide. Essentially, this puts the body in the best position to help rotate around and uh, to maximize. <coughs> So once kids have mastered this box setting, what we then have to do is how do you how do you get into that rotated position uh, from a jump? So the next step, we utilize, I utilize a springboard. Um, if you guys don't have a springboard, I maybe use a box, or I'll just go straight off the ground, just bringing that bungee a little bit lower. Um, and again, so this is Paul. He's one of our he's one of our uh, sophomore. Here. Again, I gotta pause here. So as he comes in, he 
the big lesson here is, and he does an okay job of it, but we're really trying to keep this angle away from the bar. Coming in at an angle, getting used to taking off at that angle and shooting vertically, converting into that same exact right, flat position. Now, as you notice, there's huge rotation at the knees. <coughs> so the clearance looks, he looks like he skies this, and that's the beauty of rotation is his shoulders and head actually don't clear the bar all that much, but by the time, because his body's in that shortened position, the rotation action creates huge lift, and then you see his legs kick up, and that's when people go, oh my god, he's flying about 30 feet. But all he really did was just a huge back layout over the bar, okay? Um, so, a lot of times in the back over drills, coaches are talking about, we wanna try to sky the bar as high as we can, try to jump as high as you can, maximize your height, but I'm actually trying to develop bar awareness. Um, and so I'm challenging the athletes in those drills to be as close over the bungee or bar as possible. I want them to be, be able to be in a position where they feel relaxed around the bar and not be scared of the bar. Um, we want to release as much tension or be as relaxed as possible when we're in the air. Um, and when kids are trying to overemphasize maximum height, when they start getting those PR bars where they're going to be barely skimming the surface, um, you see a lot more kids will tense up or just try to overexert themselves in the air, which then diminishes those rotational aspects. So I do not teach that arching of the back or looking looking behind, looking for something behind you. I've had I've I've been coached, I've seen I've coached kids where I'm like, I'm holding a number up, can you try to read the number? When when you go up in the air, your visual system actually <laughs> shuts down. They may not be closing their eyes, but they're not their brain is not processing visually anymore goes into a kinesthetic awareness. So when you actually are over, over focusing the visual system, their body awareness is actually gonna shut down. Again, causing more of that tension. And then again, the arching of the back is what causes that the arms and legs to overextend, elongating the body, which then slows that flipping action. So really what we're trying to do is we're trying to jump as high as we can, and then we're trying to flip over as fast as we can to try to avoid that bar at all costs. A lot of times when you see Jumpers who arch the back, it's, that's when they're kicking it off with their heels. Because their leg is actually scooping underneath the bar itself and then kicking it from underneath. Okay. So then from there, it's developing. So there, there's the aspect of just the rotation itself. Then there's the aspect of how do we create the rotation. And that's where the curve mechanics come in. I like to use basically similar uh, sprint mechanic drills. Um, I keep it very brief, very basic. I basically just use two drills. I call them calf, ham, high knee, and straight leg balance. <laughs> calf, ham, or knee dribble. Some people, they know the dribble series for different coaches. Um, calf, ham, high knee, all I'm trying to do, all I'm asking them to do is just get the calf to touch the hamstring. I don't know if you guys can see that from both sides, but calf to touch the hamstring, nice and high. Straight leg bound, the focus is straight leg, leg coming back and getting the hip to project past the foot, okay? So some visuals here. So this is calf, ham, high knee. This chest nice and tall, leaning, slight lean forward. Then we got straight leg bound. Again, they're trying to project those hips in front. And then we do a blend where we go straight leg bound to the top of the curve. And then we just add the calf, ham, high knee, and then all of a sudden it just turns into a nice, easy flow into running mechanics. And I just, we just rep that out. And we do that on the straights as well. Actually, day one, we're doing more straight-based stuff, so typical sprint mechanic work. And I, again, I specifically, I just stick to those two. I, drills to me are a way, again, of teaching understanding. So if I can get it in less drills to get more understanding, namely the knee recovery aspect of the calf and my knee, and then the, like, the hips moving through space with the straight leg bound, two drills is all I need. Leave them together, and you got really nice running mechanics. So then the only variation that I did was just putting on that curve. Along with the curve is our takeoff mechanic series. Again, these, I use three drills, and I do this on the straight for our jumpers, our long jumpers, horizontal jumpers, pole vaulters. The difference is with high jump, I just put them on that, on that curve. Uh, skip for height, gallop for distance, run, run, jump. I'll show you the examples here. There's a few key emphasis that I'm talking to them about each drill. I'll kind of go through. So the first one, next one is gallop. And then again, it's kind of like a bleeding method, like putting it together. 
So for the skipper height, a big emphasis, as some of you I'm sure have heard, is the flat foot contact. So that's a big emphasis there. One thing that I really, um, I get pretty specific on how to approach coming off the ground. Um, you hear coaches, all, push is a huge cue for coaches in a lot of different realms, whether it's acceleration, sprinting, jumping. Um, but I found that sometimes kids don't really quite perceive what that means. Um, when you visually demonstrate push, a lot of times, uh, you know, you see high knee, you know, coaches will talk about, I guess I can remember something center, it's kind of weird, but um, you'll, see, you'll see coaches like talk about pushing through the ground. So they see this action. But as you notice, as I'm demonstrating, I'm not pr projecting anywhere. So I tell kids to spring or bounce off the ground. So the spring, I tell them we're here, and I'm just trying to spring off the ground. So it goes, might be from here, but from that action, spring off the ground. So when we're skipping, we're, we're springing or we're bouncing. I usually don't talk about pushing when it comes to jump mechanics. So the skipper high, I'm just talking about that spring off the ground, spring off the ground, spring off the ground. Spring off the ground, spring off the ground. Gallop for distance, again, knee drive is a huge, uh, another huge component. And you kind of see that in the skip. So the gallop, the main emphasis is creating, just like the straight leg bound, creating hips, hip movement through space. Um, we talk about we want to see a really high knee drive, but a concentric or like muscle-based knee drive is a lot slower than if I can create stretch in this hip and it shoot through, okay? So on the gallops, I'm essentially focused, for hope it's on the right side. I'm focusing that right hip going back, you can see she gets a lot of separation. She's really not trying to force it through, it's just kind of snapping through, snapping through. So find stretch to help that knee drive snap. And then when we get to the run, run, jump, again, it's that bleeding, that bleeding effect where she's trying to feel stretch on her right hip from the gallop, and then she's trying to spring off the ground with her left leg. Give us a nice flow. And usually when they, if they do it right because of the elastic nature, the first jump will be awesome, and then each jump after that will just kind of, it'll kind of chill out. So if you watch Hope here, she comes in. Big, a less. It's a lot of energy that's created and it's hard to repeat. And honestly, in the high jump, you only get one. You don't really need to do repetitive high jumping. Um, the triple high jump would be, I don't even know how that would work. <laughs> um, so then from there, so those are, that's my, those are my lessons. And then from there, we just go straight into short approach jumps. A lot of times I use springboard again because I'm trying to get, create, and get kids comfortable with the flight. So this is more focused on flight mechanics and rotation, and it's the same. Uh, it's the same. This is more related to the box and the spring drills from before. So I might, with kids, I might go. Let's just say box is level one. The double leg springboard is level two. This is level three. Okay, so those three levels, like they're kind of grouped together. If that makes sense. On the meantime, I'm working curve mechanic and takeoff mechanics off the runway, off the apron. Um, once they can, and it's not a, it's not a beautiful progression that whole way. So some kids take a long time to really get comfortable with that. But then at some point, I'm trying to create and mend those two skills together, and that's when we just go either off of a ramp or just straight off the track and throw a ramp. And that's just straight approach jumping, or excuse me, short approach jumping. And again, as you can see, when Paul hits. trying to hit those same positions as well. Yes? Have you ever seen them use any like the lead hand? Uh, some, kids prefer, some kids like the lead hand. I'll actually show you a video later on. So I have some high jumpers that use the lead hand, and I have some jumpers that don't. Um, the biggest thing with the lead hand is you have to be careful. Again, the longer your body is in air, the harder it is to rotate. So what you'll find is with the lead hand coming in high, and as kids start to ro rotate, they'll keep it high and it'll slow the rotation down. So if, kid, if you teach that lead hand high, I don't think it's a bad, I don't think there's anything, it's, there's no such thing as good or bad in movement. If you teach the lead hand high,
it's got to come down. So you have to make sure that it comes down <coughs> to all the inanimate the world to do. And some kids do really, really well with that. Some kids don't. It's just a matter of who you're working with. So I don't think you leave it alone. I leave it alone, <coughs> and if it's natural, then I make sure to coax their hand to come down. I have to watch for that. Some kids will, will keep, it'll stay there. The kids that don't do it, um, I stay away from it. I don't encourage it. Um, sometimes I actually detract kids away from it too. If they can't get it down or if it's just not working, then we try this version as well. Oh, and then with short posts, you can also be working takeoffs, scissors. I, get, I didn't put videos on that at all, but I, I don't do a ton of scissors. Um, once they kind of got the spot down, if I'm trying to work takeoffs, I'm working more that off the track in plyos and, and takeoff drills. Um, with short approach jumping, it, I find it more valuable. You really, it's the rotational aspect. If you can, if you can build the jumps off the pliability off, off site, work on your rotation stuff with the high jump movement. The six step approach is what we normally use. So usually it's like a two step straight, four step curve. I don't measure those usually, I just have them kind of run it out. It's kind of, it's not that specific in terms of that approach setup. Um, this is a great spot to really challenge athletes to like try to increase bar height. So jumping for height, I like it on the short approach jumps a little bit better just because um, it's just gonna develop that aggressive takeoff. And then using the ramp. So ramp as a reference point is also important. I should, I should allude to that. So. In the approach talk, I, I, if we get to it, it's the last one on the, on the, on the totem pole, but on the approach, the angle of takeoff is really important. It's about a 35 degree angle. If you can see this ramp, if I extended the picture, it's actually pointing, he took the, oops, he took the back end of the mat and the front end of the mat and met in the middle. That's where that ramp is pointing. That's where their foot needs to be pointing as they enter in for the takeoff. Okay, so the ramp actually acts as a great, great guide for kids to see where that foot angle is supposed to be. If you don't have a ramp, just put, I use a tape measure, like a tape line. I guess put some athletic <coughs> tape down at that angle, yeah. So, so in addition to the foot angle takeoff, is it, are you still having them run a curve as they're coming into that box? Or is it, is it because it's short approach, is it a little more of a straighter angled approach? I try to get them to do a curve. It'll be a tighter curve than their open approach or their full approach. Um, if we're doing, I think it's a valuable tool though to come in straighter if you're wanting to really work takeoff because for whatever reason some kids because of the visual aspect of the pit don't you know aren't doing the jump well then I'll come in straight on but from a short approach again it's a slight lean you're not going to get as much rotation but I am trying to get them to some curve mechanically so yeah what is your do if you found if they <coughs> are angling more towards the back of the mat instead of that middle point. You would love the, the approach talk. I'll try to get. I'll try to show that real quick. So if they're angling towards the back of the pit, well, the back, the opposite back corner. So are you talking? You talking about here? Yeah. So if they're if they're angled back there and that's where they're flying towards, usually it means they're cutting their curve. So they're they're traveling deeper into that back corner pit, and so they just need to move back. Or it's either a move back issue or they aren't driving out far enough. It's usually, it's usually a, a, an approach length issue. Um, and sometimes it's just kids cutting the curve. They just don't, they just get aggressive. They, they see the, the bar, they want to run at it. So teaching the curve mechanics is really important. And then we got our full approach jumps. Um, so that's where we're going. Uh, run throughs where they're just, we don't have to actually do pop ups, we're just, we're, we're working on just the approach cadence, we're working on curve <coughs> mechanics through the approach, and then they're just kind of running, either just kind of like running onto the pad or they're running around. Then there's, I use ramps on full approaches as well, and then I just do normal takeoffs. Um, in high jump, because it's it's a sh really short approach, it's only eight to 10 steps, maybe even six for some of your kids, um, you should be practicing full approach jumps more than say like a long jump full approach or a full, ball, full approach. Um, with, with full approach jumps, I like to hover more around their opening heights, a little bit lower bars, because again, I'm trying to focus more on the approach and the mechanics of the approach, rather than just maximizing takeoff 
themselves maximizing height, really focusing on the rhythms and the, the locations of the approach. So there I'm actually challenging more, just let's look at the, the, the technique itself and not really going for those max jumps. Uh, plus when we're in competitions, I want them to look back on their full approaches and having a lot of mix in their mind as opposed to a lot of misses. Just reiterating, staying relaxed in that air, um, air position. So I know we've had a couple, I don't know if you've typed on your phone, you, you can, if you're shy, no one asks questions, or you can ask like just really quick, a couple, maybe two or three questions if there's any more on. That's just, that's the whole training technical system. It's pretty brief, it's pretty basic, but the magic is not in the drills, the magic is in how you frame the drills and then how you let the kids kind of experiment with it. What are your thoughts on? Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's ability dependent. Um, so uh, a good story, um, Zach McGuinn is a decathlete for us. Um, he came in as a freshman, I believe his PR was 6'3", coming out of high school. His freshman year, I wasn't there for his freshman year, but he ended up jumping 6'6", he was on a 10-step approach. Um, and he was the kid that actually had too much rotation, he was over flipping, which if you can believe that, it's just the problem you're probably, I've never had it before, I don't, I don't think I'll have it again. Um, his issue was <coughs> too much speed. So we actually cut down to an eight step from his 10 as a college, a six, six high jumper, which is pretty good. But since we've cut him down, he's been able to control a lot better and now he's jumping, he just jumps six, 11 and three quarters. Um, so the, the step is, is I only find value in the step suffice that they can perform well. So I don't care if he could jump seven three from a six step, I'm gonna have him jump from a six step. Um, I don't know, I, I'm, maybe I'll have to try that now. It's a good idea, maybe. Um, so really you just have to kind of experiment. We got there through experiment. We failed a lot. Uh, we, we made a lot of mistakes in terms of how we were tinkering with things, but we're not afraid to, I'm not afraid to make mistakes to find the, what, we, what the kid needs. So you have to kind of just be bold in trying things. And I don't know what's the, I don't know why you say this to a bunch of high school teachers, but the whole F around, find out concept, like that's a huge mantra in our practices. Where do you find the ramps? Uh, and this you had it when I got there. <laughs> so maybe talk to, yeah. Uh, if you're semi-handy, you can make your own. Yes. And what I use for the top bars is a bar stall mat to get a three point. Okay. Save I might, you, save I might be reaching out. I might, I might need the specs. I need those specs for sure. But yeah. Uh, any ideas? You can ask the gymnast folks from yeah. tomorrow there. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. Yep. Um, I did see one elastic versus speed jumper. I saw one pop up. Uh, yeah, speed jumpers do better with more speed, so obviously longer approaches. Power jumpers do better from the shorter. Um, man, you guys seem the last. It was last place, but I knew approaches would come up. So I mean, that's in the approach talk. We'll, I'll try to. I'll try to get to that here so, before we leave. But I'll get into the training and theory, and then I'll the, the approach one's not as long. I'll kind of just. I'll give you kind of how I approach. I, how I map the approaches. Um, so, there we go. so training theory. I guess were there any other questions that I missed? Or is there anything? I mean, we could have there might be time at the end too. But, um, okay. So with training, the big focus is, is this is kind of a general global. I kind of look globally and then I kind of apply it down. Um, so first question is, is how do we adapt? Um, the big emphasis for a lot of coaches that you hear and a lot of things that we focus on is the intensity, the, tr the training effort, um, and then the volume, how much of that training you're doing. Um, and there's a couple ways you can look at it per unit, like sets and reps of a squat versus the actual like whole day of the whole practice versus the whole week versus the whole month, um, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of what happens, so when you take the intensity and the volume you get, that's your training stimulus. When the stimulus is applied, it creates a, a response, a fatigue. Kids get tired and the system drops, okay? You then need recovery in order to be, be either back to where you were and or super compensate. So the easy equation here is your training stimulus plus recovery equals adaptation. Um, so biggest takeaway is when I look at this chart, this is 
there's different types of training stimulus. This is where the kind of the game is played for a lot of kids. <coughs> um, too much stimulus, not enough stimulus. Um, work and rest, they're equal partners. So if you have, if you have one without the other, you're, you're probably not going to adapt. Um, in my mind, when I look at something like this, too much stimulus has way greater consequences than too little. Uh, train your kids how you, how you cook your steak. Medium rare is always the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> Big thing that we don't talk about, though, as coaches, and, and, and I think doesn't get talked about enough, is, is density, which is the frequency of the training stimulus. Um, in high school, obviously, like college track coach, I've got it seems like unlimited time. For me, it does not feel that way. Um, but compared to with you guys with your 12 week seasons, it's you want to try to cram a lot in a short amount of time, but unfortunately, the body can only handle what the body can handle. So you have to respect the laws of, of adaptation. Um, so the when you apply a, a training stimulus is also super, super important. Okay? Especially for the long-term success and adaptation of your kid. So we're looking here, each line is like when a workout is imposed. Okay? So there's obviously the optimal, we want to catch it on the rise when they've adapted and they've super compensated and gotten better. That's when we want to hit it again and it just kind of like a staircase effect. Um, too often, and it's really easy, I've found in my coaching career, uh, to go too frequently. Hitting the stimulus too often, probably more so because of my anxiety that I feel like, oh, if we don't sprint three times a week, they're not going to get faster. If, oh, if, I don't, if I don't squat every week, they're not going to get stronger. Um, but that insecurity or that anxiety is what drives kids into negative adaptation. And a lot of times, it's going to be kids do. Um, and then there's also too infrequent. Obviously, if they're spaced out enough, then there's, there's going to be no progress. But I can tell you, if I had to choose between the two evils, that solution is really easy. Just either add more work, more intensity, or do it more frequently. This is surgery, time away from training, burnout, quitting. I, I really respect and I get, I get very nervous to over have too much density in my training. Um, so we got a oh gosh yeah. <laughs> How do you decide when you do that adaptation for your athletes? Like when when do you feel like they're fully recovered and then you can hit them again with another stimulus? Yeah. Uh, guess and check <laughs> and fail again. Uh, the beautiful thing about the body is it does adapt and it is pretty pliable. Um, it's a lot of communication with your kids, getting to know them, learning their traits. Uh, you can get really sciencey with it. There's a lot of pieces of technology out there that actually track this. But <laughs> I can't imagine anybody having 100 Omega Lakes for 120 kids and high school kids playing video games all the time. But an easy way I've found is if you have a like, really talkative social kid and all of a sudden they stop talking and they're not social, or if you have a really quiet, introverted kid and they're all of a sudden Things are kind of, you kind of have to start watching. Like, oh, maybe something's going on, like maybe something's happening. It could be other things related, but um, a lot of conversation with the kid is, is huge. And then also, um, I'll talk a little bit more, but we do some level of tracking, whether it's performance-based in their sprint workouts. Um, there's also some cool modalities that's actually cheaper. It's called like a, a tap test. It's basically just an app on your iPhone. Uh, maybe Android, but um, if you just tap your finger, it tracks your, it tracks your baseline central nervous system, how freak fast you can um, tap your finger back and forth. If you see those numbers drop, it probably means their nervous system is not firing, and you just need a day, day of recovery. Um, I got a poll for you. So we got the demands of high jump. This is kind of just demands of athleticism, being athletic, skill, coordination. You got flexibility, speed, endurance, strength, and power. Another poll for you. How would you rank those for a high jumper? Yeah, it's called the tap. I think it's a tap test. There's CNS tap test is the, is the app.
you guys are doing this on purpose. <laughs> Like strength, strength, power, skill, speed, flexibility, endurance. I, I definitely think that's a, that's pretty that's pretty good. Um, it actually might even be better than my answer. So here are my rankings. I went speed, strength, power, flexibility, then skill, then endurance. Um, reasons for that uh, within my training, especially. Speed, strength, power, flexibility takes years of consistent adaptation to see significant improvement. You guys are also, um, and I actually have, Zach, the Blinda guy I told you about, I think he's still going through puberty. So you guys do have that advantage. You guys are in that stage where they're gonna get better just because of their mother nature. But at the same rate, what they're doing in training over four years, whether it's four to 12 weeks that you're with them, or hopefully if you have the more cohesive athletic department, um, you guys can you know, really prioritize these things year round, the kid who looks like crap over a high bar, but he can put his head in the rim and dunk is gonna be a lot better of a high jumper than the kid who can rotate really well, but, but can't touch the, can't touch the net. You know, I'm talking about boys specifically, but those that can run really fast, are really strong and powerful, and can just jump naturally really high, they're just, they're, they're, they're gonna just out athleticism the kids. Skill obviously is important, Obviously, is important, but it's highly dependent on the other aspects. And then endurance in a, in a speed power based uh, sport is obviously not super specific to the event. However, there are some implications in terms of how endurance can help your recovery ability. So to, to totally negate it is is I think a mistake. Um, I can show you guys. I'll talk about a little bit how I touch on endurance without getting too far away with what we do. So how I set all this up, this, this training, these training plans and ideas based on the laws of adaptation and what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to get out of it. I would first look at just the, the, the whole season, um, so my season progression. Uh, from there, I look at what the actual week is gonna look like and then what my actual practice plan is for the day. Um, so my in-season progressions, there's general prep, specific prep, and then the championship phase. Um, I. I think I was close, I think I had like, I don't know, 12, 12 weeks, but I heard 14 weeks was your guys' season. Um, so probably for the first third, <coughs> maybe first fourth of the season, like however long the season is, I'm gonna do general prep. That's what we're doing, the, the high jump teaching system with the drills. That's where we're teaching the mechanic work. That's where we're teaching a lot of the off mechanic, or off the apron stuff. Uh, for my speed, heavy, heavy focus on acceleration like pure acceleration, um, sprinting, uh, full, and then full approach development. So that's what we're working on, uh, the approach mapping, which I'll, I'll kind of, I'll show you guys right at the end um, before we head out. Uh, strength and power, heavy emphasis, especially with the track season. Hopefully they've been lifting year round. Um, I have more emphasis in track on the plyometrics and multi throws, like kicking med balls and just overhead, or, you know, forward, overhead, backward, that sort of stuff. Um, and then there's still some general specific strength, floor work, squat, push, pull. I'll kind of get more in, in depth here. And then endurance, uh, I use a lot of circuits. So in the general prep, I'm doing harder based, more difficult circuits. Two to one is a uh, work to rest ratio. So if I'm doing 30 seconds of, of an exercise, I'm gonna give them 15 second rest before the next exercise. So we basically, that's general prep. Then we get the specific, Civic prep, you're probably actually getting into some early competitions here. Hopefully you've got your full approaches mapped out, you're practicing those regularly. <coughs> now we start getting the top speed. Um, we continue with the power and strength. Um, and the circuits get a little bit easier, but I'm not getting away from them. Um, and then as we move into championships, uh, our championship phase, still again, rehearsing the same skills, working more speed endurance. I kind of take away, actually take away strength in those last three weeks. Um, and I do more low amplitude, like really low level plyos, just trying to kind of stimulate the system. Easy circuits, and then flexible mobility, that kind of just, I don't, I don't mean to just like, ah, that's whatever, it's not a big deal. It is a big deal, but it just, they need to always be doing the same stuff all the time. So just your, your 
standard flex static flexibility, dynamic flexibility. Um, very, the simpler the better, the best way. So in a weekly layout, this is how I lay it out, I have high stimulus days, low stimulus days. The high stimulus days are the things that we talked about, like that's what will really drive the fatigue down. Um, so that's our full and short approach jumps, sprints, and strength and power. Um, they're all, I pair those together on one day. I want the body to adapt to those certain elements. And then we have our, our low stimulus days. Those are the days where we are wanting that recovery to come back. Um, a very general, easy way that I kind of balance that fatigue to recovery ratio is I just do a one-to-one -one, um, until I decide otherwise. So if I have a high day, I'm gonna go low day. High day, low day, high day, and then weaken it off. If I go back-to-back -back high days, then I'm gonna go two low days. Um, and then you can even do it where you're going low, high, low, high, you know, maybe it's a recovery week. Three low days, two high days. Meet days, I always count as a high day. Um, so you can, you can also plug in place, like if you know you have a, a meet Tuesday and Friday, you can kind of plug in where you want those low days. Um, and vice versa. So the, the planning of each is, is really important. Uh, two to three jump days a week. So again, like even though skill was lower on my list, it's still important. All five of those are equally important. Um, so in season, I'm probably touching on high jump twice, two to three times a week, high jump skills. Um, in a practice, I want to be really focused. Uh, I coached one year in high school, and I remember it can get, depending on the size of your school, the size of your team, it can get pretty pretty chaotic at times. Um, we got we got 14 year olds who they're just, just they're learning they like the opposite gender. And they're just running around and then it's idle day. And then you got 18 year olds who are like really into it and really want like they're state competitors and they want to be great. Uh, so you have a lot of a wide range of, of abilities and focus levels. So I try to, I would keep it as concise as I can in terms of the things I'm trying to get done. So I'd rather go two, two themes in a session than all three like I, I showed. So the combinations, high stimulus days would be like a short or full approach high jump and then the speed and that's it. Another day would be a jump day and work in plyos and strength. And then maybe another high day would be just like, just athletic based, not worry about technique and just work on power and speed just to feel more athletic. And then same with low stimulus days, you know, there's the endurance and jumps combo. So those are kind of the, the combinations I would plug and play. And just kind of, you gotta figure out what works the best for you. I didn't want to give you guys my way of doing things because we I am also working on we're working on pole wall javelin did like my system and what I'm doing today is totally different. So but I the, the plug and play is kind of how I solved my issue of there's a lot I have to get done in a certain amount of time. So this is kind of how I make it through the week. So speed workouts again I keep it super basic. Um, acceleration uh, 30 meters or less Top speed, especially for high school kids, even some uh, developmental college kids, they hit top speed around 50 to 60 meters. So I'll do a, a 10 meter fly or 20 meter fly in that zone. Uh, and then speed endurance is pretty much anything beyond that. For some kids, it might even be 80 meters would be a speed endurance bout of effort. Um, I don't program volume in my session. Um, so my train plan looks really basic. I'll literally say if we're doing acceleration day, 30 meters. What I decide is I use drop off, and typically I'm doing one to two percent drop off. So I we're lucky enough to have it's called a Dasher system. It's, it's a laser system um, compared to other laser systems. It's actually very I'd say very affordable compared to you know it's only maybe fifty hundred bucks, fifty bucks, something like that. Um, it's Wi-Fi connected, iPad. So um, and there's other systems that you know the whole gamut in terms of what you might have. A, you know, free lap is a big one too. So I'm using drop-offs. So once the kid, the PR for the day, let's say they have a 10 meter fly, they run a, that's easy math, one flat, 10 meter fly. Once they run a 1.1, what did you say? Uh, the workout stops. So some kids might run two 10 meter, they might run three 50 meter dashes. And that's, that's their speed day. Um, in speed work, I, it's all about quality. It's all about, it's not about how much you do, it's about how intense you do. So that's, that's kind of, and then I, sometimes it, there's days where I don't have the timing system where I just don't feel like setting it up because I can be lazy at times. I have a cap, so 200 meters, 
total acceleration, 300 meters total, and top speed and 500 meters total. So I wouldn't let, if I'm not dropping off, then I wouldn't let them do more than that. Sometimes I've had kids though, I had one gal, she did 20, 50, like 20 fly tags. She just never dropped off. But she's also, doesn't have a huge speed capability, so her body can just, it just needs more, it needs more exposure to stimulus. Power, we'll look at different plyometrics and multi-throws. Uh, I'd say these are way more valuable for jumpers. So I have a takeoff series, which I already kind of showed you guys. We do it on the straight of the curve. The gal skipped the height, one of her jumps. Uh, horizontal bound series, this is just a remedial one. Um, you guys know who Goosh and Extrainer is? He's LSU's longtime coach. I steal literally everything <coughs> from that guy. Um, and he's, I email him all the time. He's really accessible. I recommend, if you don't know who that is, look him uh, So these are like two of his bounding series. The vertical jumps is actually, I'd say, the most important. Um, this ball, this is the vertical uh, plyos. About 10 to 15 meters of bounce. And again, like I talked about, that big spring action, that's what you're working on. Foot underneath the hip, driving up. So Paul, coming out of high school, 6 eight high jumper, he's a little bit more of a power-based jumper, but we're trying to get him to learn how to take off more of a speed jumper. Only reason being in pole vault and long jump is far more valuable um, in those events to be a speed jumper. So he actually, it's not the crispest vertical plyo series I've ever seen, I'll be honest, but we're working on it. And uh, for as simple as the drills may seem, it's actually pretty taxing for him. Um, this is just that same takeoff series Hope showed you earlier, just on the straight. So again, skip the height. Uh, I do. Um, two caveats are I would only do it on my turf or a pad, like some sort of gymnastics pad, and I would do very, very, very remedial based plyos. So if we're doing like the vertical hops, which is actually a great, could be a great plyo, I'd be more just focused on light and easy. If I'm trying to go for like a big hit, I'm going to have them I'd like to do more of it. It's harder with our facilities. We the, we have one pool on campus and it's in the wellness center, so it's open to students. So it's, it's more of a scheduling issue for us. Basically, it's do that pool workout at six in the morning or don't do it at all. And I'd rather, the college kids, I'd rather get them eight to nine hours of sleep. But I think pool is, it would be amazing. If, I could, if, I, if we had our own pool, I'd probably be in that thing three times a week. I think the pool is one of the best things assisted bands if a kid was coming off of some sort of surgery or injury where they couldn't handle the load um, but I would rather develop low amplitude true jumping and build than use the assisted um, I think it, it's definitely got its place but I see it more on the rehab or converting from rehab to jumping than actual training stimulus I think it's a good gap or a bridge of that gap um, but I would rather be Low amplitude plyos progressing into like a depth jump or something. That's kind of how I see it. Which assisted plyos are way more easy, if that makes sense. Um, Strength. How big, how big is that kid that did six eight in high school? How big is he? Yeah. Uh, he's about six four. He's probably about one ninety, hundred ninety pounds. Um, strength. I again keep it very very basic. Uh, squat hinge, push pull, and core. One exercise for each, 10 perfect reps. So whether that's one by 10, two by five. I don't know if you guys know the name uh, or Dan John, the strength coach. Um, he co-authored the book called Easy Strength. I, to me, it, I think it's the best, it's the best strength program if you're trying to be more than just a power lifter. Um, again, we're just trying to create stimulation to create a change in the body. Um, we don't, I don't believe we need a high number of volume of strength. All we need to see is if I squatted 100 pounds five times in two sets, it was fairly difficult. In three weeks, it got easier, and now I can squat 150 pounds two by five, and it's fairly difficult. And it's 
that's all we're trying to do with spray. Uh, so the goal is increase strength, high quality reps, increase the resistance over time, and then once we're at a certain level of strength, we're just trying to increase power, which is high quality reps faster. So that's kind of how I do the strength studies. So endurance, uh, the circuits, 10 to 15 gross movements, usually body weight based. Sometimes you, you can use med balls and do different things. Um, sometimes you use like locomotion, like like crawls and different things. Um, partner carries. I don't know if you can do that in high school anymore. But, um, 15 to 30 seconds of work. Easy recoveries are two to one rest ratio, or excuse me, one to two rest ratio. So again, if it's 30 seconds on them, we give them a minute rest. Or we'll just do 10 reps of the exercise, as much rest as they need. Um, just trying to get the body moving. Sort of thing. I'm not trying to tax anything, I just basically want to, to groove the joints a little bit. Moderate circuit uh, is a one to one, so 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. Uh, and then the hard circuit, two to one, so like 30 seconds on, 15 seconds off. Variety here is the key to preventing injury, injuries. So on those off days, get really creative. Um, try to be a, as far away from plyos and jumping and sprinting as you can. A lot of in place stuff. I basically, I kind of just make it up on the fly half the time. Uh, just kind of read what the kids are doing and have like a, I have like you know, hundreds of exercises, I'm sure you guys do too. Um, the key on the endurance too is, even though it's like an easy recovery, so the one to two, that doesn't, the effort has to be the same. It still has to be a high level of effort. Um, you're just giving it more recovery. <coughs> the reason why the, the circuits work in recovery is because it produces that like muscle burn. That muscle burn is basically lactate and that small dose of lactate plus recovery actually just stimulates the body to be like, hey, something's happening, but it's not enough work to, to uh, diminish the muscle or diminish the tissue. So it just it basically puts the body in this like, I need to send hormones to this area, but then there's really no damage. And then it's just the body gets all the recovery hormones and it just makes the, it just makes the recovery a lot faster. So sometimes it's better than it just a straight up day of rest, but you have to be careful not to, to overdo it. Again, it's, the point is not to get tired, it's more just to do a little muscle burn and then recover. Do a little muscle burn and recover. Those hard circuits, that's like, I mean, I've had kids that, have, I didn't try to do this, but uh, they puked after a circuit, in place circuit workout. I didn't go that hard ever, that was a mistake. I, I don't try to make kids puke, but it goes to show like you can get a really, really difficult, intense fitness workout from just body weight squats, push ups, sit ups. And then flexibility, mobility. Again, there's variety is key here. There's yoga, partner stretching, banded stretches, meditation, spinal segments, shoulder. Yeah, again, as much variety as you can get. I find, you know, having a few different things it just keeps the kids active. They never know what they're gonna get. They always respond underneath them. A lot of times, once kids know what they're doing, especially seniors, I'm not even here for this. I like to see, and obviously it's different for you guys, but I would let seniors like run these and, and give them the opportunity to be leaders and teach kids how to do these exercises. Um, so it's just a good way to, to train or to recover, I should say. Um, and then I'll, let's see. Perfect. 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 Um, I'm gonna run. Are there any questions on training? I'm gonna go really quick. So the one, the drive transition curve, and it's kind of how it's broken down. A ten step, I 
we go five step on the straight, five step on the curve, eight step is a three and five, and then the six step is a two and four. Drive phase here, um, transition, and then the curve itself. So it's kind of shows how that's all broken down per per different approach map. Drive phase, usually one to three steps. This is where we're developing momentum. We want to start slow and strong, progressively pushing out and up, and then crit it's critical to drive on that straight line. I just want to touch base. The, the biggest mistake kids can make here is there's really two two big mistakes. There's either most kids will either cut in or cut out. And that ruins the curve. Um, and then most kids will start way too quick. They they want to they want to get out they want to get out of that hole and they want to push and they go hard. Uh, I can't stress enough how important it is to start slow and strong and build as opposed to quick out of the gate. If you start full throttle, you got nowhere to go. Most of the time, that's when kids start. If they start too hot, then they're going to end full. Transition phase, so that's going from the straight into the curve, is usually a three-step three transition. Shoulders stay on the original line. So I'll come up here. Shoulders stay on the original line, and the action that's happening is actually the feet are stepping, as you can see, I start leaning forward, but the feet are actually stepping outside of the shoulders. Okay, that's what creates that internal lean. So the outside foot is actually what initiates the curve. So it's that step right there. And if you can notice, it's a subtle detail, I'm pretty proud of this. Um, <laughs> there's a slight deviation off of that straight line curve to get back to the um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but PowerPoint is not a good graphic design uh, mechanism. So, yeah, so that outside, that step right here is vitally important. What you'll find, the big mistake there is kids, will, if they, they're straight on, they're doing great, and they'll just overdo it. It'll, you'll see, instead of the shoulder staying and just stepping slightly out and start curving, they'll, their whole body will just move. So they'll be moving forward, and you'll see this. Whoop. Sorry to get in your you're personal good. space there, but... Um, <laughs> So that's a big mistake as well. Because ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to create this curve. Um, we want to feel on the out, outside part of our feet. Inward lean, meaning the whole body is, is a straight angle. Um, what a lot of times kids will do is get that sensation of leaning, is they'll just, they'll break at the hip. So their legs will be straight on, but their body will lean. Again, a part of it is a fear mechanism. It's scary, but I mean, this is, that's not a fun feeling, um, even just to do that. Hip and shoulder staying perpendicular, so another big mistake, I just, I'm sorry I'm not elaborating too deep on these, but kids will over turn to get into the curve, or they won't turn at all, and you'll see this where they'll run in the curve, and then they're, it'll be like this. Both of those stuff. Um, so you gotta make sure that it stays perpendicular, feet outside and the lean, everything stays together. Key elements, these are, I mean, I could talk, I, I could talk about these for probably an hour, two hours. Posture, the big mistake, so we want a nice neutral body. The big mistake that I see most kids is just the, the arching of the back. Um, a lot of times it's because the kids are being driving and they'll shoot their heads up and then you, get, you see this a lot. And that's, we don't want that. So we want just a nice neutral spine, flat back. Amplitude of movement, again, this kind of, and frequency development. Those both allude to kind of what I was talking about. Um, I would have a demonstrator, but just to quickly explain the, so amplitude of movement, we talked about nice high knee flexion. Well, again, we got to focus on also the knee extension, so getting the hips past. So thinking about the, the thigh as a big pendulum, and we want to see that big range of motion the whole time, even when they're getting quicker. The mistake is kids will go way too quick so it'll start nice and big, and then you'll see quick, and everything gets really small, okay? As opposed to nice and big, relaxed, and then slowly, but staying. You see, there's, it's, a, it's slight. The quickness is slight. I think sometimes, and I do this too, is I over-exaggerate and over-coach being quick, and then they get too quick, and then they, it doesn't work very well. And then take off to flat, flat contact, um, remain, remaining on that curve. Biggest mistake here is taking off too close to the bar. Um, 
We want, we're in a lean away position. We need space to travel <coughs> vertically. When we're too close, you just don't have, you don't have the room to travel. So here's a video of Zach. He's, this, is his, this is his 611 jump from a couple weeks ago. When he comes in, a lot of rotation. But the key here, from that point, look at all the space in this area. So big lean away. And because of the forces of the curve, it, they throw him in, it actually throws him up and into the bar. So the whole idea of don't jump into the bar, it's, it, it's gonna happen no matter what. The curve is throwing them there. Um, you just need the space to allow them to get thrown. Uh, <coughs> Even with an option to bar farther, he's going up higher, so he's starting farther out, so he's got that space to move. Yeah, so like when he started, we were probably, like he, by the time we got, when he came in, because it's the multi, he came in pretty low for his opening height. But as he kept progressing, he would miss his opening heights almost like every other jump. And part of it was because he was too close. So if I get from the start of the competition to the end of the competition, he had probably moved back, straight back, like two feet, three or four feet. Uh, I, I don't with these guys. I probably wouldn't ice iron these guys. Um, with the college kids, I have the check mark down by the x-axis just to keep straight on uh, but I don't want them looking uh, they have a little we have way more time to really practice the approach so we don't need those visual cues I would say with high school kids I would probably put that mid mark on where they need to curve and then you need to better gauge those guys you just you just, guys just don't have just enough time to, yeah. to work that stuff um, quickly take off steps so beginners um, again, that ramp angle I was talking about, or putting a tape mark, like I put, I'll put a tape mark on that angle, on the one that's pointing right in the middle 